All right. So welcome to CEF Day Vancouver. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, this, we, we've been kicking off a whole series of CEF Days this year, and it's great to be back at the Open for Summit. For myself, it's been probably six or seven years since I've been at one of these. It's wonderful to see the crowds are still out here, and folks are still very excited about using CEF and Open Infra and all things open source. So it's great to see folks here. And uh, first, I'd like to tell, say a little bit about myself. For those who don't know me, I've been working on the CEF project for uh, basically my whole career. I um, started off with the startup Ink Tank, um, even before it became Ink Tank, uh, working across multiple areas of CEF. And uh, through Red Hat and now I'm at IBM, uh, managing a few teams of software and developers working on CEF to this day. Um, in terms of um, the CEF itself, the CEF project is not, is not, is, um, helps gov governed by the CEF Foundation, which was formed in 2018 to promote and uh, foster the project. There are 32 members across multiple industries and geographies, and it's just a general home for collecting all the stakeholders within the CEF community together and pulling resources together to improve the project and the community overall. So we've, we've uh, put on lots of CEF days, CEF Lacans, which are multi-day conferences. We have had the most recent one in Amsterdam a couple of months ago, which was fantastic. Um, it, the CEF Foundation also does things like funding, upstream, upstream documentation, and marketing. If you're interested in helping out with the CEF project, this is a great way to get involved, even if you aren't a developer. So feel free to contact us if you want to join. So this, we had many different CEF days this year across the US, Asia, and this, this week we had one in, in Seoul, South Korea, and today in Vancouver. And our most recent, this is a photo from our Cephalocon Amsterdam, which was a couple months ago. It was just an absolutely packed conference. Um, incredible content across three different tracks, so really good talks there if you want to learn a lot more about Ceph in detail. I definitely recommend checking those out on the Ceph YouTube channel. You can find all information about other events here. And if you want to organize a CEF day, uh, we're, we're starting to think about planning for next year already, please send an email to uh, foundation at CEF.io or come find us afterwards. And I'd like to say a big thanks to our sponsor for today's CEF day, OS Nexus. Uh, Stephen Umbahaker will come up and give a talk afterwards about, about uh, OS Nexus. But I'd just like to say thank you very much for the support. So, before I go into uh, more about Ceph itself, I want to take a quick poll of the room. How many folks here are already using Ceph? Okay, how many folks are not using Ceph? Okay, so maybe this intro part I'll keep a bit short. Um, so I'll just, I'll just talk a bit about uh, what Ceph is and why we are. You've probably heard of some, one of this before. You know, you can hear it described as the Linux of storage, uh, software-defined storage, unified storage system. But what does this really mean? Well, Ceph is all open source. It runs on commodity hardware, all kinds of different networks and, uh, and, and disks, whatever kinds of servers you can think of. And it provides access to storage in, uh, across mul all different protocols, object block and file related. Ceph has always been very focused on um, freedom of choice and, and open source. So it's uh, free as in beer. Anybody can take it off of GitHub and use it. Um, it's free to modify and share again. And it's, Ceph has always provided the freedom from vendor lock-in. Anybody can take the code, run it themselves, improve it, and share their, their improvements with the community. The big focus for Ceph has always been around reliability and quality, so making sure that you, know, you don't lose your data. It's a pretty important aspect of a storage system. So one of the big focuses of Ceph is on really make, making sure that it, your data doesn't have any single point of failure. Durability is always maintained, even if there are outages happening, nodes going down, disks failing. And there's no minimal interruption in service and from any, kind of these, any, any of these events. And as easy to use during upgrade processes or online expansion or shrinking of a cluster as possible. And in general, Ceph is always favoring correctness and consistency so that your data maintain, remains safe over uh, availability or performance. Ceph is also des designed for high scalability, so you can start off with a very small system and grow it to multiple petabytes. You can add or remove software uh, storage over time. Um, Ceph doesn't care what, what size the disks are. You can 
mix and match all different kinds of things together in one system, and Ceph will deal with it uh, very, uh, straight out of the box. In the last uh, perhaps uh, seven or eight years now, there's been a lot more interest and focus on multiple data center and disaster recovery um, capabilities. So there's lots more interest in replicating uh, data between different data centers, either for disaster recovery or for maybe access from multiple areas of the globe at once. We have uh, one group coming online in one day, working on things in one area, another group coming online later in a different time zone, and you can shift your workload kind of around the globe that way. So Ceph is always built uh, uh, on this underlying Rados layer. Uh, Rados is the reliable autonomic distributed object storage system, and it forms the basis of the, uh, all, all the other Ceph protocols. It handles all the details of replication internally, so everything built on top of it doesn't have to worry about all of that. They, they just uh, store things in as objects in Rados, which has a very rich kind of object-oriented API. Then there are three main interfaces for accessing Ceph. There's the Rados gateway for S3 or Swift style object access. There's the Rados block device for you often use with virtual machines in OpenStack or containers within Kubernetes. And then there's the Ceph file system, which uh, as you can imagine, you could use in any place, any, any, any place where you want a shared file system with access from multiple points at once. So I'll go a little bit more into depth on how Rados works. Um, it's, as I said, it's, it's all focused on strong consistency, and it's providing a very low-level kind of object API where you can interact with a, a single object atomically in a very um, reliable and scalable way. So you can do um, kind of com really complex transactions on a single object, and it'll all be maintained atomically and consistently across however many replicas or however many uh, erasure-coded shards you've, you've uh, configured. There are a few different aspects of Rados. Uh, three main demons. There's the uh, Ceph monitors, which maintain kind of the overall state of the cluster, which demons exist, which disks exist, uh, are they up or down, that sort of thing. Generally, you need an odd number of these to maintain a majority state, and they use the Paxos algorithm to maintain this uh, uh, consistency and, and a consensus about what, what the cluster looks like. So usually you only need three of them. For larger clusters you might use five, maybe up to seven, but it's not, it's not really something that you scale out. Then there's the manager, which uh, kind of aggregates real-time statistics from all the different demons and has a number of different kind of pluggable modules for uh, orchestrating the cluster and uh, doing other things like uh, the manager is also hosting the, the uh, the, the web, web UI, the dashboard for Ceph, among other things. Finally, the most numerous daemon is, is the object storage daemon, or OSD. This is usually deployed kind of a one per disk configuration. Uh, if you have multiple different kinds of disks, you might be passing, uh, uh, giving it multiple, part, uh, giving me uh, different partitions from an SSD and uh, one hard disk per daemon. But in general, it's, it's responsible for storing the actual data on, on these disks and managing all those all the replication and um, kind of cooperating with each other to rebalance data as needed and notice any, anything that's failing and report it back to the monitors. So when you're looking at uh, a data storage a uh, application, generally in the past you'd have a kind of legacy architecture where you have a single application talking to a single server, um, maybe with uh, some kind of pairing for HA or, or failover, um, but you wouldn't be able to really uh, scale this out very well. You'd have a, a really big bottleneck in the, the main gateway there. So Ceph is really more about uh, client versus cl to cluster architecture where any given Ceph client can talk to all the OSDs and all the monitors in the cluster as need be. And any of the, any of the things that are storing data in Rados are going to be striping the data across many objects that are spread across all the OSDs in the cluster, potentially, or at least within whatever pools you have set up. So you get the full parallelism of the cluster, and you can get a very, very good performance, especially for large parallel workloads. So with this data spread around the cluster, how do you find it? 
where, where does an applicant, how does an application know when it's writing to this object where that, where that goes? Well, there are a few strategies here. Um, one, one classical approach is to have some kind of metadata server where you go and ask the metadata server, where is this data? That's great for a small system, but for a system like Ceph where you're talking about millions, billions, trillions of objects, that doesn't really scale. So Ceph takes a different approach, which is um, calculating placement of objects. It, it has um, this map of, of the cluster called the OSD map maintained by the monitors. And this tells Ceph kind of which demons are up and down. And from that map, it'll calculate, given a, a given object, where, which OSDs the object will, should live on. So that, that tells cl the clients um, if, they, if they have the name of the object and the OSD map, that's all they need to know to figure out which OSDs to talk to. They don't need to do any extra lookups. They can just go directly to those OSDs and talk to them and get the data they need. And whenever something changes in, the, in a cluster, like say a, a, a disk dies, um, the OSD map gets updated, that OSD is removed, uh, the new OSD map is, is distributed in a, in a gossip fashion to all the other OSDs and clients. So whenever, and, and whenever one finds that they're talking to another daemon or a, cl a client finds that it's talking to another daemon with an older, a, a newer version of the map, the new version is immediately shared back across the cluster. So everything is kind of distributed um, in a nice, even way. And the updates are propagated quite quickly that in this way. So Radius is a very um, rich API for um, object storage. At the underlying layer, it's uh, m much more flexible and powerful than you might think of uh, when you think of object storage as, as an S3 type of uh, object. Radius objects are kind of more like files in that you can access and address them at a bright granularity, and you can update and do, and do all kinds of complex transactions, uh, even customized ones on, on the OSDs themselves. They also have um, a, a kind of attribute and or key value uh, interface. So you can store some sm relatively small structured data there to have an easy way to look up and access things. Um, or you can just use them as uh, buckets of bytes like you would a regular file. And objects are organized within Ceph into uh, pools. So you might have pools for different use cases. You might have pools, one pool that's maybe stored on SSDs, one that's HDDs. Maybe you have um, so certain pools that are for uh, certain one file system that's more temporary storage with a different set of settings than you have another pool for a more long-lived storage, this sort of thing. So. When you're talking about storing objects in pools, that's how a user uh, or how a how client sees um, uh, sees readers. Uh, in order to find the OSDs that are, uh, that it needs to talk to, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, it's it's, it's working based on the um, OSD map and the name of the object. In order to make the management of these objects a bit simpler and uh, take less overhead. We also further subdivide pools. We shard them into what are called placement groups, or PGs. So each placement group is just a, an arbitrary shard of a pool, which means that um, all the objects in a given pool are distributed approximately evenly among the placement groups. And to find out which, which placement group an object belongs in, the client simply takes a hash of the object name. <coughs> And the placement group is the is the piece that's actually fed into the um, the placement algorithm to look at to look up based on the placement group and the OSD map, which tells you which OSDs are up and down. You know precisely where your data is being stored. So this is that's a kind of a simplified version of uh, how the client and readers protocol. Uh, with, when you have replication involved, it's very simple. A write goes to the first uh, OSD in the placement group, and that OSD will replicate to the other OSDs. Replication can be any number of replicas you like, from two to, most I've seen people you like regularly use is four, but usually three is a good default. You can also use erasure coding with Ceph. This is much, uh, much more space efficient, 
especially for very large objects, objects uh, like you'd see in an S3 sort of environment. Um, it's possible to use it with other things like with, our, with uh, blocker devices and the file system as well, but it has a high, high performance impact when you're doing lots of little random writes. So it's usually not as, as a good a, an idea to use it for those use cases. But with the ratio coding, the idea is, is, is kind of similar to replication. The writes are going to the primary OSD, and it's, it's uh, breaking up the object into relevant um, chunks for the erasure code. You can kind of think of erasure coding as like a more generalized version of RAID, where you have some um, stripes that are just regular data, and then some parity stripes at the end. And those are just divided among several different OSDs to maintain that durability guarantee. So in, in general, Rados is all about virtualizing your infrastructure and your storage. You can have all kinds of different hard drives, SSDs, and uh, determine how exactly you want to manage it and how it's presented to the user, um, organizing it into different pools and choosing replication factors and ratio coding factors. With replication, you can even change the replication factor dynamically. That's going to add a lot of extra copies or a lot of data movement as you're doing so. Um, with erasure coding, it's more of a, it, it's only possible to set that when you're creating the pool. So you want to really consider what kind of uh, erasure coding you want to use at the, at the beginning when you start setting things up. Um, that's a good general overview for Rados. I think since um, folks are already pretty familiar with Ceph here and are, have already used Ceph quite a bit, uh, we'll leave some extra time for Stephen to go into more detail on uh, his things. So thank you very much. Yeah, Stephen. Okay. Yep, and I'm not sure. Yeah. The program, I think it comes at like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 